بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله Brothers and sisters, I greet you with the warmest Islamic greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today's topic is why Allah is worthy of our worship. Now, for me to unravel this topic, I really want to discuss the most important part, which is a key that opens the door to the rest of the discussion. So what is this key? It's knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, know that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah. Okay? No. So Allah is saying to us that we need to be on this path of knowledge to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But as you know, knowledge in Islam is not a secular understanding of knowledge. It's not having a database or filling PDFs or apps on an iPhone, right? We don't have a computational model for the mind, okay? We have a spiritual model for the mind. So when we know some data, we internalize it. And this is very critical because I don't want you learning one or two things here today than walking out and not internalizing them in your life. So knowledge in Islam is actually the ability to take that data, that knowledge, and to internalize it. It becomes part of your spiritual DNA. It becomes you. It's part of your state of being. And this is critical. And an example to highlight what I'm trying to say here is many mothers and fathers in this room know what good food is to feed their children, right? Vegetables, right? Good proteins, right? Right, what did you cook your child last week? Yesterday? What did you buy them on Friday night last week? Chicken and chips, rice full of ghee, right? So your knowledge, in an abstract sense, doesn't improve your actions at all. There is a gap. And that gap is tarbiyah. That gap is the spirituality in Islam, which is ibadah, which is worshipping Allah. It links that abstract knowledge and you internalize it and it changes your state of being. Anyway, point is, Knowledge is not just abstract like being an iPhone or an iPad with lots of data. It's internalizing that which you know. So it's not just memorization, it's internalization. Right? And this is very, very critical for us to understand. So Allah says, know that there is no deity worthy of worship but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's just summarize this. One reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is our Rabb. Okay? Now Rabb, generally speaking, is translated as master or owner. He is your Lord, but it has far more linguistic and spiritual connotations. Essentially, He is the absolute owner, master, maintainer, sustainer of the universe, of everything that exists, of all creation. And not only this, there is a subtlety in the root here, which is He takes care of, and it's through an act of love and mercy. This is why in the Quran, when you see changes in personal pronoun referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rabb is used for intimacy. Therefore pray to your Lord and sacrifice. But in this chapter, the first verse referred to Allah as we, right? We, verily we have given you the abundance, then it shifts. Therefore pray to your Lord and sacrifice. So Rob has this sense of intimacy, sense of also glory and power that Allah owns the universe. He's the master of the universe. He created the universe. He sustains and maintains the universe. So this is a very important aspect of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to deny any of this is what we call a form of shirk. Associating partners with God, which is one of the greatest sins in Islam. This is why atheists, those who deny the the Rabb, the Rububiya, the Lordship of Allah, they're mushriks by the spiritual definition of Islam, right? So this is very critical for us to understand. So Allah is the maintainer, owner, sustainer of the entire universe. Second point. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has names and attributes, right? We read it in the Quran and we see it in the Sunnah. Allah describes himself as Al Wudud, the loving. Coming from the word wud, which means a loving that is giving, right? Allah is Ar Rahman. He is the intensely merciful, right? Sometimes we translate Rahman, Ar Rahman as the merciful. That's actually a bad English translation. There are three connotations for this word. Number one, that Allah's mercy is an intense mercy. Number two, it's an immediate mercy. Number three, it's such a powerful mercy that no one can stop. Okay? So this is 
what needs to come to your heart and mind when you start thinking about the word Ar-Rahman, okay, when the name Ar-Rahman. So Allah has names and attributes. These names and attributes, right, we believe they are maximally perfect. This is very important to understand. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is maximally perfect, meaning there is no deficiency or flaw concerning His names and attributes. You hear this in Christian theology, God is the most perfect being. We, we actually have something very similar in the Islamic tradition where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has maximally perfect names and attributes. For example, when He is al-wudud, He is loving to the, from a boundless point of view. He's maximally the loving and he has no deficiency and no flaw. This is very critical for us to understand because it's going to link to other questions that we're going to discuss later on. So Allah is maximally perfect and he has no deficiency or flaw. flaw. Now we affirm all of the names and attributes we could find in our source texts in the Quran and in the traditions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay? We don't make ones up. Right? There is no such name as the angry one, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't defined himself as the angry one, for example. So we can't just make that up. Oh yeah, Allah is the angry one. That would be totally, totally blameworthy in our tradition to do this. We stick to what Allah has told us and what the prophetic traditions have told us. However, there is a caveat. There are few things that we can rationalize outside of text, and, and that is indicated in the text as well about some aspects of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, that he has qudra, he has power, he has a will, he has knowledge. This could be ascertained rationally. But the general rule is that you stick to the text concerning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? This is not a blind faith issue. This is actually an intellectual issue. Because if someone was to knock on the door right now, someone's knocking on the door. We don't know who's coming in. Who is it? We know there's an entity, right? There's a power, must have some kind of will, there is an entity behind the door, but we don't know who it is. I can't say now, oh, it's George, or it's your cat, <laughs> right? I can't say those things. We would have to say, who is it? And the entity tells you. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is outside of this universe. He is transcendent, right? We have these ayat, these signs in this universe that are knocking the door, the intellectual door. There is a rub. There is a Lord, there is a creator, something's going on, right? But we can't start saying, oh yeah, it's, um, it's, 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 it's the spaghetti monster, as the atheists say, right? Or the flying teapot, or it's an elephant with 12 arms. This is an irrational, speculative, that's why Allah calls it dhanni, speculative, assumptious, and unjust as well. Because you're ascribing to Allah that which doesn't belong to Him. So we know there is a knocking on the door and we have to wait for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the message in, term, in terms of telling us who He is. Now what we do with these names and attributes, for example, we do not humanize them, right? So we don't say Allah is the loving and Ilyas is the loving too. This is a form of shirk, is associating partners with Allah. You're basically saying that Ilyas is just like Allah, right? You can't do that. So you're humanizing the names and attributes. And we can't even deify people as well. For example, if we see Haytham here and we say to him, Oh, oh Hudayfa, I do apologize. The reason I said Haytham, bro, is because I tweeted him. He's the CEO of Muslim Matters and he had to do something for me. <laughs> so that's why he's in my head. May Allah bless him as well. Grant him Jannah for those and you and your family. So, Hudayfa, MashaAllah. What was I going to say? Do you know? Can you see the future? Do you have telepathy? No? Because I totally forgot now. You spoke my flow. <laughs> I've got it, no. So Hudayfa, for example, if I said to him, you know, he's powerful just like God, right? So I'm deifying him, okay? And this is shirk, this is associating partners with God, which is not only irrational, but blameworthy and the greatest evil in our spiritual tradition. The third point is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deserves worship. We must direct all our acts of worship to Allah alone. We single out our acts of worship to Allah. And the best way to describe this before we continue is referring to the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he said the essence of worship is, who knows? Dua, the essence of worship is supplication, right? So when you supplicate to Allah, you are 
asking for something, right? So if I say to Allah, Ya Allah, give me ikhlas, give me sincerity, right? So if I ask Allah, give me sincerity, that's a form of worship. It's actually the greatest act of worship because it's the essence of worship, supplicating to your Lord. Because you know He has the power to give you sincerity, right? Now if I said to Zakari over here, you know, I may supplicate to Zakaria so he can give me sincerity. That's, that's shirk, right? That's associating partners with Allah because I'm attributing to him an ability that he doesn't have, right? I'm attributing to, an ability, uh, to him an ability he doesn't have. And not only that, I have directed a key act of worship to something other than Allah, right? So from the Islamic spiritual and intellectual point of view, we direct our supplication to the Lord of the universe. And this is very, very critical for us to understand. Allah mentions this and makes it very clear in the oft-repeated chapter we recite during our prayers. It is you we single it is you we single out for worship, and it is you we single out for help. Okay? And by the way, this help doesn't mean you can't ask someone for a cup of water. Um, if you look at the tafsir of Ibn Kathir, it's basically to do with the fact that you're asking help from Allah because only Allah can give you that help. For example, if you say, yeah, Allah want twins, right? Allah could give you twins. But if you say, Ilyas, give me twins, that would be impossible. He's a four-year-old, right? He has no power. But you are strong though, okay? MashaAllah. So from that point of view, it's asking help from somebody that doesn't have the ability that will be shirk, right? That will be counter this verse. So it's very important for us to understand that we single all our acts of worship to Allah alone. And we're going to start to discuss now why Allah deserves to be worshipped. So we had to spend some time discussing who Allah is. We have to know who Allah is briefly and then start to discuss why now does he deserve to be worshipped, okay? So the first point I want to discuss is Allah deserves to be worshipped because who he is. And this is very critical for many of us. I was here a few months ago and I had a brother come up to me and said, I was praying every evening and then I failed my exam so I stopped praying. And I was like, hold on a second. Since when are you on par with Allah? When are you on par with God? It's not a business relationship. You know, you have a contract. You know, I give you a few prayers. You give me something back with a little bit of interest, okay? I mean, this, this is a form of the ego. We have deified ourselves. We actually deserve something. Allah deserves worship because of who He is. He is the maximally perfect being, therefore He deserves praise, and praise is a form of worship. We do this all the time, people. Boom, Messi, he's such a great football player, right? Sheikh Isa Nimatullah, he calls him a jinn because he's so good with the ball. He must be a jinn, he can't be human, right? So he's so amazing. Look at that guy, wow, right? Don't we do that? Don't we do that, guys? Usain Bolt. The fastest man on earth, right? 100 meters. Yeah? Right? Well, right? Don't we praise him? Even me when I saw Mo Farah doing the 10,000, 5,000, something inside me, something was going on. It's like, go bro! Go bro, yeah? Come on Mo! Right? That's what happened. My son was, it was the, the Olympics. What Olympics was it? The Scouts Olympics. Running 200 meters. I didn't care who was in front of me. Beautiful, brilliant Zachariah. Come on, Zachariah. I was acting like I don't care who's around, right? I'm just like my dad. I'm like that, yeah? And, you know, I had it yells on my shoulders and people were thinking, who is this guy? <laughs> he can't be Asian, yeah? Because <laughs> they wouldn't do things like that. <laughs> he must be some crazy Greek guy because we break plates at weddings. Anyway. So, you know, I was like expressing myself, like, wow, look at the movement, isn't it brilliant? You know, I'm a boxing fan, for example. When I see Mayweather, although I'm not a huge fan of his personality, may Allah guide him. But basically, you know, his shoulder roll, his defense movement, it's just phenomenal, right? You praise him. He's done nothing for you, <laughs> right? But he has some attributes that are praiseworthy, right? Even if you didn't even see the manifestation of his attributes, you still praise his people. If I said to you, in the next few seconds, the most loving human being is going to come through this door, and you believe me, but you haven't seen that love being expressed by him, everyone still wants to meet him. Because he has that definition, right? Right? We even do it with the Prime Minister and the Queen. <laughs> right? We don't necessarily know them. Right? But you just want to, you know, try and please them and see them because they have this high praiseworthy status, right? 
We do this all the time, even in marriage. Oh, he's an engineer. He's a doctor, bro. Right? He must be the best Muslim in the world. Oh, don't worry. He was in the pub because, you know, he likes that drink and it wasn't alcoholic. But he looked very tipsy, right? We give all these excuses, right? Just because they have a praiseworthy status. So when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is maximally perfect, right? His names and attributes are perfect to the highest degree. They have no deficiency in flaw. So when he's al-wudud, he is the loving. And nothing can compare to his love. And he's the most powerful. Nothing can compare to his power. Right? And he's the all-knowing. And nothing can compare to his knowledge. And he's al-hakim. He is the wise. And nothing can compare to his wisdom. Then what should that do to us? Shouldn't something happen within us to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right? Doesn't just make sense? But we do with everybody else, some limited contingent creature, right? Limited. But you could, no one could ever bench a thousand pounds. No one could ever bench a thousand pounds. Bench press, right? No one could run a hundred meters in one second. It's, it, these some things are impossible. We have limits all the time. And we forget this because of what marketing and the egocentricity I spoke about earlier. Right? Impossible is nothing. You have no limitations. What a stupid thing to say. <laughs> you, you're full of limitations. Your shape, your size. Fine, push the boundaries. But don't make it go towards the kind of spiritual disease of egocentricity, yeah? So the point is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most powerful. He's got pure, maximally perfect love. He's the most merciful. And yet, nothing happens in here for us to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a praise is a form of worship. It's the key to worship. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. All praise and perfect gratitude belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the first line in the Quran. Right? An indication here that you have to start with praise and gratitude to understand the rest of the book, to understand the rest of your life, to understand how you're going to have a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So regardless, Allah could have given you the crumbs of the universe. You could have suffered a, a life that was not very pleasant. He still deserves worship. You could fail your exams. He still deserves worship. You could lose your husband. You, he still deserves worship. You could use your legs. He still deserves worship because of who he is. And even when these things happen, there is a fundamental and absolute divine wisdom and goodness behind these things. We just don't know it sometimes. And it's only through connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we'll get that sakina, that tranquility to be able to understand why these things happen. It is fundamental for us to understand, brothers and sisters, that if you're given nothing, Allah still deserves everything from you because of who he is. Because he is the being with maximally perfect attributes, names and attributes, to the highest degree possible. And if we could praise some runner who could run 100 meters, right, or someone who does a little tune, right, or someone who could rap, or great poetry, or great poets, then imagine how we should react to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of who he is. This is very critical. Second point, why Allah deserves worship. First we said it's because of who, who Allah is, right? Now, Allah deserves worship because of who we are. This is very interesting. Because in the Islamic spiritual tradition, the Prophet ﷺ has told us that he created within us a fitrah, an innate nature, an innate disposition. Fatara, fatrun, fatarahu. Something has been created within us that's unchanging, that has a form of knowledge. And that knowledge is to know Allah, to worship Allah, and other ulama in our classical tradition said, to also understand a certain basic goodness, right? So there is innate nature within us, as unchanged as being created by Allah. And our very nature is to worship Allah. It's who you are. So when you don't worship Allah, it's like committing spiritual suicide. It's like having a pen with no ink and thinking you're going to write. It's who you are. You are the khalq of Allah. You are the creation of Allah. He is al-khaliq. He is the creator. And 
the creation of a creator is always fundamentally linked in some way. Your link is through worship. And it is you. You were designed for that. And this is why Allah makes very clear, and listen to this ayah, it's going to blow you away. Allah says in chapter 39, verse 29, Consider the condition of two people. One man is a slave, a servant to many masters, and they are all quarreling. Another man, he's a slave to one master. Whose condition is best? Who? Who's got the best condition? Some guy who's a slave to many masters and they're all arguing? Or... One man who's a slave to one master. Whose condition is best? The second. Hudayf is right. The man who's a slave to one master. My tadabbur here, my pondering of this, over this verse is, if you don't worship Allah, you're going to be worshipping so many different masters. And you see in your life, don't you? Who do you love the most? Who do you refer to the most? Who are you in awe of the most? Right? If you don't worship Allah, if you don't love if you're not in awe, if you don't refer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you're going to be doing that to something else. We see it all the time. Look at, look, at, look at Justin Bieber, right? You have all these girls and little boys. Oh, I love him so much, right? You know, sign my hijab, yeah? <laughs> right? Or whatever, right? He's such a great singer. Follow him on Twitter, right? Want to know him. Writes in their diary, I really, really, my dying wish is to meet Justin Bieber, right? Even has acts of worship like gratitude, pay for memori memorabilia and like products that are linked to Justin Bieber, buy a huge expensive concert tickets, right? This is like a form of worship. And then that person's gonna grow up and worship other things as well eventually. Like what? Their boss, maybe, right? Social pressure. What are people gonna say? We've heard that a lot in the Asian community, haven't we? What are people going to say? Wallahi, take that out of you. It's the biggest disease in the world. It'll, it'll, it'll kill you. We've become expectations. We haven't become human beings. We've become brands. We haven't become humans. And it exists in our community. We need to take it out. Even if it means embarrassing yourself. Because it will save you in the day of judgment. I'm telling you. Because a lot of the things that we do, we claim to worship Allah. But what we do, we care what other people think. We do, don't we? Shh! What are people going to say? Who gives a damn what people say? What does Allah think about us? That's the important thing. If Allah is good with you, it doesn't matter anybody else. Everyone's going to fall in line anyway. We always care, don't we? Right? Your dress is not sparkly enough on the wedding. Who cares? Your wife, bro, she's not fair enough. A little bit dark, isn't it? You know, bring out the fair and lovely. We see that in the auntie's drawers all the time. Yes or no? It's a disease. We need to speak about this. It's a disease in our community. We care what people think. We have this post-colonial social spiritual slavery. I was in Malaysia a few years ago and they had a huge billboard. And it was like, white is right or something, fair and lovely. They were advertising that cream. Would you believe it? And in my talk, it was about God's existence, but I had to speak about this in the beginning. I was like, if Malcolm X was alive today, how would he describe you type of people, right? House Malaysians, right? It's just crazy. We have to really understand this. Anyway, the point here is, it's a given that you're manifesting signs of worship, even if you're not worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people do it as a football team. I remember some of the brothers, they hired a Newcastle football stadium, part of the stadium, to do some Islamic event. And you had some of the football guys calling and saying, hey, we don't come to your Mecca, don't come to ours. Right? And you, you have this, you know. Just think about it. The thing you love the most, the thing you want to know the most, the thing that you obey the most, and the thing that you're grat you have the most gratitude to, that's your deity. Right? That could be a concept, because that's like the shirk, the associating partners with God. That's the type of shirk of conceptualization, you know. You have this with some old school communists, don't you? Right? Marx becomes their God. <gasps> How can you say anything about Marx, right? He becomes like divine. He is wahi, you know. His, his, <laughs> his what do you call it? Is it manifesto? What's it called? I forgot what it's called now. What's his paper called? Anyway, what he wrote. And what his comrades wrote, right? It becomes like the gospel truth, the divine doctrine. How dare you challenge such things? 
It's from a man, bro. I'm just conceptualizing here, you know. We have that, don't we? We get so like, you know, we have these forms of worship. We have it in everything when it comes to politics, society, sometimes even in our partners, right? It's a big test to marriage, isn't it? If your sp spouse is the only one that you love the most, and that love is a barrier to Allah's love, there's a problem, right? Right? If our love becomes ishq, ishq in Arabic is like the possessive form of love, that's a hujjah on us. That's like, you know, evidence against us because that love should be for your creator, not for creation. Don't get me wrong, love your spouses, people, yeah? <laughs> we don't love them enough, that's for sure, yeah? So I don't think many people suffer from that problem. But however, I'm trying to give you an example here. Yeah, it's very important for us to understand. So, it's, worship is part of who we are and if you direct your worship away from Allah you're going to be worshipping all of these slave masters your politician, peer pressure, your friends, society, television, L'Oreal, marketing, materialism, what people think you're going to be a master to, you're going to be a slave to all of these masters they're all quarrelling and you're never going to be happy Allah makes this clear for you makes it very clear for you so worship is who we are and it's our purpose in life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that He didn't create man or the spirit world or jinn except illa liya'budun, except to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next point why Allah deserves worship is actually because of His favors and bounties, right? But we see this in the wrong way. We think Allah has to do me some good, like get me a big house. Allah loves me because I got a good job. This is totally wrong and it shows how greedy we've become and it shows how, you know, the world owes me a living. We've become so sensitive to our own life, right? And we forget the fundamentals, people. And I want to break this down from an Islamic spiritual perspective right now for you to wake up. We all wake up together. First point, there is something in your life that you would sacrifice a mountain of gold for and it's given to you freely every moment you don't deserve it you don't own it and you couldn't bring it about yourself what is this thing? there's a thing that's given, you, given to you every moment brothers and sisters and friends every moment and that thing is so precious you would sacrifice 10 earths for it it's given to you freely and you don't own it, you don't deserve it and you cannot bring it about yourself. Yet it's given to you freely all the time. What is this thing? Who said that? Well done bro. It's our conscious existence every moment of our life. You want a big house and a big car, a nice wife and lots of money and you haven't been grateful enough for the very thing that Allah has given you to be able to even ask for such a thing. We are deluded. We're in a state of heedlessness, spiritual ghafla, heedlessness. We want all of these great things. Allah says if you're grateful, He'll give you more. But grateful about what? Oh, thank you Allah for giving me a house. No, 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 no. There are some things that are fundamental you have ignored and forgotten like your very existence which is so precious you don't earn, you don't own, you don't deserve, you can't bring it about yourself and you don't even thank Allah. You think, oh I deserve life. Excuse me, you can't even create a fly. Who are you you deserve life? You rearrangement of electrons and carbon. Who are you? Who are you? SubhanAllah, we need to belittle the ego and humble ourselves because that is a key to open the door to connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because ego is a barrier to God's mercy we have to realize this brothers and sisters there's something in your life it's given freely it's so precious every moment if I give you a thousand pounds a day you don't deserve it you don't own it and you couldn't bring it about yourself who are you gonna think? who are you gonna think? me right? okay now say I did this for a year and after a year you start thinking the thousand pounds. You start thinking the thousand pounds. Isn't that stupid? Right? It is, isn't it? That's what we do sometimes, don't we? We think we're the source of our own existence. Look at me. I'm going to the gym, bro. I'm, you know, fit, amazing. Sometimes we are born as if we're catapulted from our mother's womb with a briefcase and a tie. 
Wallahi, we live in this excessive neoliberalism, the disease of society, because it teaches human beings that you're just an abstract individual divorced from social attachments. That's not my words, that's a feminist philosopher's words, Marilyn Friedman. Check her out. She's a communitarian. She discusses excessive individualism. Even the Children's Society report that was published in 2009, it said the same thing. Our children suffer from this excessive individualism, right? Right? We need to be really be aware, brothers and sisters, that we are not the source of our own destiny. We don't, we don't control everything. It's not all because of us. The very fact that you were able to have a briefcase and have a good job is based upon almost an infinite number of variables that were in place in order for you to do that. If your mother wasn't there, for example, if you didn't, you know, tolerate the pain of labor, if you didn't have a hospital, right? If there was no food, right? Nutrients, medication, all of these things had to be in place for you to be here. And ultimately, that goes back to whom? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't think that you, you know, all of a sudden, it's just from your own power and your own ability that you are who you are. It's because of Allah, fundamentally. Don't forget this. SubhanAllah, that's why sometimes, you know, when I reflect on the dog, the animal, I'm telling you, the dog is here, I'm here. Why does Allah mention dog in the Quran for us to reflect? Allah never uses animals for jokes. Well, you think, you know, let me just put dog in there. That's not the case with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Reflect on the dog. If you reflect on the dog, brothers and sisters, the dog feels that its owner, its master, is the source for its existence, right? The dog would tolerate a thousand sufferings. If anyone has seen programs or had a dog before, you see, you hit a dog, it stays with you. You don't feed a dog, it stays with you. You backbite, slander a dog, it stays with you. You gossip about a dog, it stays with you, right? You don't give love to a dog, it still gives love to you, right? Because a dog sees you as its source of its existence, source of it being alive and it, it having a sense of security. And look how a dog acts towards us. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we know He is the necessary being. Without Him, we couldn't have anything. Everything depends upon Him. We are so contingent and dependent upon Him. Yet how do we act towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Nothing like how a dog acts to its master. Something to think about. Another favor and bounty we need to talk about is you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that you can never enumerate His blessings. You can never count Allah's blessings. Absolutely. This is a fact. I think I found a really good example for you to understand this. And this example applies to people who suffer or people who have a good life. Regardless. Brothers and sisters, the thing that Allah has used as a physical cause to maintain your life is the heartbeat. Right? If I stopped your heartbeat right now, what would happen? Generally speaking, you won't survive, right? Right? Good. So we already mentioned that the priceless gift is life. And one of the physical causes that enables you to be alive is your heartbeat. Now if I said to you, you have 1,000 heartbeats left, and I said to get another extra 1,000, you have to give me your iPhone and 2,000 pounds. Who would give me the iPhone and 2,000 pounds? Put your hand up. Everybody. That's how precious just that extra 1,000 heartbeats is. Even though it might take us 1,000 heartbeats to get that money and give you the phone. Give me the phone. Right? So how precious is one heartbeat? Extremely, right? Do you beat it yourself? Who controls your heartbeat in your life? Allah. Okay. Right, from now, count all your heartbeats you've ever had. Do it. Count all your heartbeats you've ever had. Count them. One, two, three. Come, keep on counting. It's impossible. For the first three years, you didn't learn how to count backlog. When you're sleeping, you don't count your heartbeats. You can never count the blessings of Allah, ever. Even one small blessing like the heartbeat. Forget everything else, like your health and your wealth and, your, and everything else that you have. That's why I say to the kids, Anything, 
extra from our heartbeat is a bonus. We're living in the lottery. We have bonus balls all around, man. I'm telling you. We're living in this life. We, we should be so happy. No one should have any excuse. Well, lie, especially living in the West and being in the top 2% of the world. Anything above a heartbeat, grateful, gratitude. And if we're not in that spiritual state, realize it, it's a disease. I'm not here to judge. I have that disease too. Right? Al mu'minu miratul mu'min. The believer is a mirror of another believer. But I'm telling you, you want to make, have a happy life? You be grateful for the most basic things that are so fundamental to your existence. And realize you don't own those things. You can't control those things. You don't bring about, bring about those things. Once you internalize that point, I'm telling you, you will never be sad. Anything above a heartbeat, brothers and sisters, is a bonus. The next point. We need to love Allah, which is a form of worship as well. And sometimes we don't speak about love. But our ulama, our classical scholars, the sahaba, when they understood the verse about illa liya'budun, except to worship Allah, right? That meant to love Allah as well and to know Him. And it's very significant. Because we mentioned this earlier about maximally perfect attributes. We say it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-wudud. Coming from the word wud, which means a loving that is giving. His, his love is maximally perfect. It's greater than even a mother's love. Because a mother, she needs to love. It's a contingent type of love. It's dependent for her to feel whole. Allah's love has no contingency. Allah doesn't gain anything. He's perfect. Independent, al ghani Allah is independent, free and rich, yet He loves. Just imagine how pure that love is, brothers and sisters. You can't even imagine it. And that's Allah's love. So how can you not even try and love that being? Al-Ghazali, the 11th century theologian, in his 36th book of the Ihya, of the Revival of Religious Sciences, he closed the door on this topic very well, like on many topics, you know, he was really powerful. He mentions about love. And he basically says that human beings love themselves. And what he meant by love is what Eric Fromm spoke about love in his Art of Loving, which is not a love that is, look at me, I'm a narcissist, I'm so gorgeous, I'm so amazing. Not that love, that's ego, that's blameworthy. But it's the type of love that you want good for yourself, right? You don't want pain, you want pleasure, we want to be happy. Jannah, paradise, right? We want to be happy, that form of love. I love me because I want me to be okay. I, want, I, want to, I don't want pain, I want pleasure, right? This form of love, Al-Ghazali says, if you do have this natural form of love for yourself, then it necessitates logically and spiritually you have to love Allah. Because who created you? Who created the asbab, the physical causes in the universe in order for you to use to run away from pain and to embrace pleasure? And he said, if you don't love Allah, then you're deluded. It's like a drunk type of love or a drunk type of happiness or a drunk type of contentment, you know. Because you haven't realized that necessary logical, intellectual and spiritual link between your self-love and the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also, as I said earlier, if someone came into this room and they were described as the most loving human being, you, you don't care if you're married or not. You just want to know where, what is that love, right? Obviously with halal means, but you want to find out, you know, what is that love? How do I taste some of that love? How do I know to love like that? You'll be, it will be irresistible. It'll be like, it'll be magnetizing, right? Allah's love is greater than any type of love. So how must we be yearning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Finally, brothers and sisters, another form of worship is obeying Allah. You know, in secular discourse, to have faith and obey things, especially when it comes to religious things, is so, you know, so medieval, so a few <laughs> centuries ago, yeah? I want to basically take this out of your head. Obedience to Allah is the summit of rationality. Obeying Allah is the peak of what it means to be a human being. Obeying Allah is the peak of intellectual activity. Obeying Allah is the most rational thing to do. Don't let people think this is irrational. 
they have an ego, the disease of egocentricity. Because we obey things all the time. I travel a lot on a plane. Pilot says sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be experiencing media to severe turbulence. Fasten your seatbelt. Buckle up. What do I do? I don't start moonwalking down the aisle, do I? I start moving around, doing some backflips, right? No, that's stupid. What do I do? I sit down and I buckle up. I've obeyed the pilot. Why? I have no idea on how planes work. I know it's to do with the pressure, but I it wasn't good at physics, okay? Khalas. I don't even know what turbulence is. I just know it makes the plane move around, right? And sometimes it feels like it's going to snap in two, okay? I don't know the science or the wisdom or the knowledge of turbulence, yet I'm obeying the pilot because I consider him an authority. When I go to the doctor and I give them my symptoms, and he says, right, if you take this medicine or do this physio, you will get better, inshallah. What do I do? I don't say to him, you stupid fool, that decade of learning you've done is irrelevant. I'm not going to do that. If I clap my hands, do a little spin, I'm going to get better immediately. Right? <laughs> I don't do stuff like that. I obey the doctor because I know they have an authority in this matter, right? We do this on most spheres of our life. And this is part of Western philosophy. Anyway, if you read the works of Dr. Elizabeth Fricker, she's an epistemologist, someone who studies knowledge. She says, given my limitations as parametric, meaning I have my own limitations, right? Given that I have limitations, I can't know everything. I can't know everything, so I have to rely on the authority of others. It's just a given, right? Many atheists do this to me all the time. Oh, bro, your views on consciousness are so wrong. Oh, why, my beloved friend? Oh, because Dan Dennett wrote in a book. Oh, really? What did he say? I don't know, but read the book. <laughs> right? You get it all the time. You get it all the time, right? So, obviously, that's a cliche on atheists, but I, that's my experience, right? I can't change my experiences, but that's been my experiences, especially on social media. Anyway, so, point here is, we obey all of these authorities. And they are not the ultimate authority. Allah is the ultimate authority. He has the totality of wisdom and knowledge. He has the picture. We have a pixel if we have a pixel. So isn't it more rational to obey Allah? Isn't He more of an authority than the pilot? Isn't He more of an authority than the doctor? Of course. That's why obedience is the most rational thing to do. And shaitan's story, now I'll end on this, shaitan's story, brothers and sisters, is a lesson for us. Shaitan was the first pseudo-rationalist. What did he say? Allah says to him, the ultimate authority says to him, bow down to Adam. What does shaitan say? Because of his ego, ego. That's what made him disbelieve was ego. Very careful here. Shaitan said, I'm made of fire. He's made of clay. Thinking that he was more rational because he had his limited senses around him. You need fire for clay, right? But he disbelieved. Because he now deified himself. He went against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the ultimate authority. It's like a five-year-old walking to an Oxford lecture by one of the greatest mathematics professors, and he's teaching people calculus. And the five-year-old says, that's not calculus, this is calculus. And it's his own scribbles of Humpty Dumpty or something on, on a piece of paper. And yet we have, we arrogate, we have so much arrogance, brothers and sisters. You know, as, as humans, forget Muslim, whatever, as humans, we're so arrogant. And we feel, and we think, Straight away we have to say, oh, does it really mean this? Does the ayah really mean this? Does this hadith really mean this? Fine, it's good to use your mind over the text. Absolutely, Allah tells us to do stuff like this. But the first question we have is, my mind is more of an authority than, than the ultimate authority, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's dangerous. Professor A.C. Brown, he makes a really good point. He studies hadith. And you should check him up. He's got really good books coming out. And he, and he talks about traditionally... The Muslims, they had less ego from that point of view. And when they looked, for, when they looked at a prophetic tradition that looked, they were a bit uncomfortable with, their first question was, 
how do we bring it inside the fold of the Islamic discourse? How do, how do we reconcile? But what we do these days is, how do we dismiss? And that is nothing to do with intellectual activity. It's to do with our state of being, our spiritual state of being, our egos. And it's very important for us to understand this very clearly. So I'm just going to end. I know I'm going over time, but just three more minutes here. I would like to end on this note. Everything that I've said, or the concepts that I'm trying to deliver to you, these are the primary things we should be giving to our wider community, our brothers and sisters in humanity. The Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith in Bukhari, in Tariq al-Kabir, love for linnas, for people, humanity, what you love for yourself. The word here is not akhihi, like the other hadith, it's not Muslim or, or Muslimun or whatever, it's an-nas, linnas. Love for humanity, what you love for yourself. And if we've understood worship properly and we love Allah the most, we must be sharing this love with other people. Right? How do you share this love with other people? You give them da'wah. You invite them to the beauty of Islam in the most beautiful way. And if you disagree, it's okay. That's why you have to search into our tradition. It's a tolerant tradition. It's a merciful tradition and we're not afraid of discussion and dialogue and we're not haters, right? If you study our history, it was medieval Baghdad, you had like an atheist, an empiricist, a modernist of the time, <laughs> right? All these other different people having discussions at our universities, right? In a tolerant manner. You know, look at Maimonides. Musa bin Maymun, he was not Muslim, he's considered the second Moses in the Jewish tradition. He wrote theological treaties in Arabic. Musa bin Maymun is a product of Islamic Spain. And Islamic Spain implemented some of these core values of convivencia, coexistence, tolerance, bringing people together. Yes, we, we're different, but we're not going to otherize you, right? And this is very important because in social media today, Muslims have become the other. We've become otherized. What's otherization? Otherization is the basis of genocide. And it's not saying there's another group. There are other groups. Blacks, whites, religious, non-religious. Groups are there. It's rational. Otherization is saying that group is all the same. Muslims, they're all nasty. Muslims, they're all terrorists. And that's the otherization. That's the basis for genocide and hatred. Extremism. In all forms, in all forms, starts with a form of otherization. And our tradition actually doesn't teach us to otherize. Yes, we have, there's non-Muslims, there's hypocrites, there's all these categories. But what does Allah say in Surah Al-Imran, verse 113? People are not the same. And if you look at that tafsir, the exegesis of this ayah, that even amongst the Jewish and Christian community, the people who are upright and just. Do you see the point here? There's not an otherization going on. Everybody's the same, right? And that facilitates connection, dialogue, discussion. Let's see if you're right, if I'm right. How can we understand this? If we don't understand each other, if we don't want to embrace each other's teachings, fine. We're still going to live peacefully and move forward in a tolerant, harmonious way, right? This is very important. So share this love with others in a merciful, tolerant and compassionate way. As the Prophet wasallam said to Aisha, Oh Aisha, be kind, be compassionate. If you have kindness and compassion in something, it elevates it. If you remove it, it degrades it. So I hope you've gained something beneficial from today's uh, discussion. Remember, these lectures or talks, you know, I know, it doesn't mean you could go outside now, now I know everything about why Allah deserves to be worshipped. No, it's these talks about planting seeds in your heart and mind so you can continue your intellectual and spiritual journey. Don't think you gained anything from me. I'm just opening my mouth, making some noise. I've planted a seed. If I have, then let it grow. But that's your own work. The work doesn't stop here. It's just the beginning. It's part of your intellectual spiritual journey. And this is why it's very, very important, brothers and sisters, that you start to be on that journey to water that seed so it grows into the fruits of good things. Okay? Absolutely important here. Because, you know, we have to take this stuff seriously, okay? Because, you know, many of us, if you have a house or a car, I've seen how careful you are with the contracts and the wording and all the knowledge behind everything. But when it comes to Adin, we go to some miskin Hamza, just became Muslim 14 years ago and says, Oh, Hamza said, Hamza's nobody, 
And as you realize in your spiritual journey that you're nobody too, and through that nothingness, it elevates us because we realize we are an abid. I'm a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah bless you guys. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.